Today we will be having our last complex concepts lecture covering the concepts of globalization and terrorism. So what is globalization? Well, there are quite a few definitions, but regardless of how you define it, it seems to imply the integration of world cultures, economies, and political systems. So what does that mean? Well, that means that there's been an increase of communication. You guys have only ever really grown up in a world where it's so easy to communicate with anyone from around the world through the internet and cell phones, texting, and all of the various forms of social media. The frequency and ease of international travel means wonderful things like tourism, and that has eased with globalization. Here on the screen, you can see a map showing all of just one airline's international flights. This ease of travel has allowed more people in the world to understand their neighbors and understand other countries. It certainly is what has allowed me to have traveled as much as I have. And with more travel, more communication around the global world, we have more cultural understanding. It's more important than ever for us to understand why other countries act the way they do, what part of their culture is influencing their decision. Of course, with more cultural understanding, more interconnectedness, we also see more people removing themselves from this idea of cultural understanding. But it also means that illnesses spread more frequently than they once did. First documented in 1986, mad cow disease began spreading throughout Europe. It causes fatal degeneration of the central nervous system in cattle. And the fear was that ingesting infected beef would spark the occurrence of mad cow disease in humans, which it did, and it would cause other countries to stop importing beef from those countries you see on the screen. Another global disease is bird flu. Most birds carry the flu virus in their intestines and don't suffer, but among domesticated birds it's often incredibly virulent. While it's rare for humans to be infected, since 1997 it's not so uncommon and you can see on the map areas reporting confirmed occurrence of bird flu or as it's more properly known, H5N1. Within just the last few years, we've had more diseases pop up that are influenced by globalization. One such disease is MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, also known as camel flu. As of yet, there's no known vaccine or cure. 40% of those who become infected die, and most recently, someone flying from the Middle East where they had contracted MERS wound up in South Korea and caused an outbreak in that country. But by far the worst outbreak has been Ebola. Ebola was first identified in 1976, and since then there have been a total of 25 outbreaks. The most recent outbreak has been going on since 2014, and as of right now, there have been almost 28,000 cases and over 11,000 reported deaths. Another way that globalization makes itself felt is in the interconnectedness of our economies. As more and more countries enter the global economy, individual countries are able to specialize, focus on making those things they are good at producing. This in turn means that we depend on other countries to provide some of our necessities. This specialization has occurred with the Asian tigers, the countries of Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea. The map you see on the screen shows the relative size of the country as indicated by the relative size of GDP. So you can see that a small country like Japan, over here, is much larger because of its GDP than it is in actuality versus a country like Russia, which is huge geographically, but its GDP means its economic influence can be relatively small compared to countries like Japan. 
As countries interact with each other economically, their currencies rise or fall, get stronger or weaker, relative to each other. For example, in our current economy, the U.S. dollar is on the strong side, which is a relatively new trend in the recent years, although previously the U.S. dollar was quite strong before the recession. The Australian and Canadian dollar are worth only about 70% of what the U.S. dollar is worth. However, as you can see on the graph, the euro has recently started plummeting due to many issues the European Union is having. And thus, while the dollar is still weaker than the euro, it is nearing parity. What this means is that when the dollar is weak, our trading partners like Canada, Britain, and the rest of Europe can get our goods for cheaper. But when the dollar is strong, Americans are able to purchase goods from other countries cheaper than they used to. In other words, when our currency is strong, our money goes further. Other relationships, like our close trading ties with China and Japan, actually don't hurt exchange rates so much. For instance, the value of the Chinese yuan is worth about one-sixth of the American dollar. And about 119 Japanese yen are worth one dollar. Because exchange rates and costs of living vary so much around the world, it is sometimes cheaper for businesses to outsource. On the upside, outsourcing keeps domestic costs down and provides valuable jobs, usually in third world countries. You can see on this image where all the parts come from to make a Boeing plane. Here are the only parts made in the US. But you can see that our planes are made by companies in Japan, the UK, Canada, Sweden, Italy, Australia, and South Korea. On the downside, outsourcing removes jobs from the domestic market and is sometimes exploitative. This is an image from the Rana Plaza collapse, which was an eight-story building that housed several garment factories in Bangladesh that made clothing for many different brands, including Walmart, Children's Place, and Joe Fresh. When this building collapsed, there was a death toll of 1,129, and approximately 2,500 people were wounded. This building was never meant to house all the factories it did, and basically the people working in these factories worked in a sweatshop. One horrific problem that has sprung up, some say in response to increasing globalization, is terrorism. Terrorism is defined by most governments as the unlawful use of, or threatened use of, force or violence against individuals or properties to coerce or intimidate governments or societies, often to achieve political, religious, or or ideological objectives. As the definition indicates, most terrorist groups are formed because of political, religious, or ideological, often ethnic, goals. In most cases, terrorist groups are universally seen as radical. Many instances of terrorism, or the rise of terrorist groups, can be traced back to colonialism and or imperialism. The Irish Republican Army, as a terrorist organization, was formed in 1969. Its aim was to protest and obliterate the partitioning of Ireland, with Northern Ireland belonging to Great Britain. There was a ceasefire declared in 1997. At the 1972 Munich Olympics, a group of Israeli athletes were held hostage and later murdered by Black September, a Palestinian terrorist organization. You can see here the images from New York Times, as well as the most famous image of one of the Black September members. Another form of terrorism is perpetrated against one's own government. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols bombed the Alfred Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Their motive was revenge for the way the government handled Waco and Ruby Ridge. They were sympathizers with anti-government militia groups. You can see the damage done to the federal building, as well as one of the victims, one of the youngest, from the Oklahoma City bombings. Another form of terrorism is aimed against the West and often more specifically against the U.S. In 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. A Libyan intelligence officer was convicted of the crime per perpetrated to protest U.N. and American sanctions against Libya and its leader, Muammar Gaddafi, 
who would ultimately be ousted by a NATO mission in the 2010s. In 1993, a bomb exploded in the underground parking lot of the World Trade Center. The suspects were from a variety of Muslim-associated groups and happy with foreign and especially American influence in their areas. Obviously, the new terrorist focus is Al-Qaeda, formed by Osama bin Laden sometime in the late 1980s. It arose as a response to Soviet presence in Afghanistan, but its stated goal is to end foreign influence in Muslim countries and to reestablish a Muslim caliphate. In 2001, Al-Qaeda pulled off three different attacks in the United States, and one was redirected. These bombings were in pursuance of Al-Qaeda's stated roles. While terrorism had been around prior to 9-11, the agendas of terrorists and the fear of terror attacks became more present after 9-11. As the years have gone on, the world has seen only an escalation in the number and variety of terror attacks committed. One of the first major attacks after 9-11 were to occur at a nightclub in Bali on October 12, 2002. It was carried out by a local Islamist group and would kill 202 and injure 209. On March 11, 2004, simultaneous bombs went off on Spanish commuter trains three days before the Spanish general election. 191 were killed and 1,800 were wounded. The attack was connected to an Al-Qaeda-style terrorist group. In Beslan, Russia, on September 1, 2004, a Chechen group would take a school hostage. The hostage situation would last three days. In the aftermath, 385 were killed, including 186 children with an unknown number wounded or reported missing. On the 7th of July, 2005, four men would detonate bombs in London public transport. This was the UK's first suicide bombing and its worst terrorist attack since the Lockerbie bombing. It would kill 52 people and wound over 700. The attack was supposedly in retaliation for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Over the course of four days in November 2008, a Pakistani Islamic militant group would carry out a series of 12 coordinated shootings and bombings in the city of Mumbai, India. The attacks would kill 164 and wound at least 308. The Tsarnaev brothers would detonate two pressure cooker bombs at the finish line of the Boston Marathon on April 15, 2013. The bombs killed three and injured an estimated 264 others. Over the course of three days in September 2013, the terrorist group Al-Shabaab attacked the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, Kenya, in revenge for Kenya's military actions in Somalia. Gunmen would kill 67 and wound 175. In Kunming, China, on March 1, 2014, a group of eight knife-wielding men and women attacked passengers at the city's train station. 29 were killed, plus four of the assailants, and more than 140 others were wounded. The attack was carried out by Uyghurs, an oppressed Muslim group within China, leading Western news outlets to be reluctant to label it a terrorist attack due to the human rights issues surrounding the Uyghurs. On the night of April 14th into the 15th, 2014, 276 female students were kidnapped from a school in Chai Bok, Nigeria. This attack was carried out by Boko Haram. 219 of the girls are still missing. On October 22, 2014, a shooter in Ottawa, Canada killed a soldier at the National War Memorial and then entered the Parliament building where the shooter would be killed before he attacked anyone else. This would be the biggest security breach at the Parliament building since 1966. A lone gunman held 18 people hostage at a chocolate cafe in Sydney, Australia from December 15th to the 16th of 2014. Three people would be killed, including the gunman, and four would be injured. On December 16th, 2014, seven gunmen affiliated with the Taliban would enter the Army Public School in Peshawar, Pakistan. 145 people were killed, including 132 children, ranging in age from 8 to 18, at least 130 people would be injured. This would be Pakistan's deadliest terror attack. On January 7, 2015, two brothers forced their way into the offices of the French satirical network Charlie Hebdo in Paris, killing 11 and injuring 11. On the 18th of March, 2015, three gunmen dressed as civilians attacked the Bardo National Museum in Tunis, Tunisia, killing 24 and injuring 50. 
The Islamic State would claim responsibility, but local authorities would blame Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. On August 17, 2015, a bomb was set off inside the Erawan Shrine in Bangkok, Thailand, killing 20 and injuring 125. As of right now, authorities are still unsure of the reason for the bombing, as well as who the perpetrator or perpetrators are. You will hopefully notice a few things from this list. First, that the frequency of global terror attacks has been picking up over the last few years. And second, that we did not list a South American terror attack on this list. That is not because there are not terror attacks in South America. There are currently fewer terror attacks in South America than there were in previous decades. The attacks that do occur are most often related to rebel groups within that specific country, like FARC in Colombia or Shining Path in Peru. There are other consequences to terrorism besides just an increase in fear and death and unstable governments. More recently, the increase in terrorism and civil wars in the Middle East and Africa has led to the current migrant crisis in Europe. In 2001, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, the safe location of al-Qaeda, in order to destroy the organization and ferret out Osama bin Laden. The U.S. Army will call this Operation Enduring Freedom. The U.S.'s military action in Afghanistan was seen as fully justified by many of the U.S.'s allies and even some of our enemies. Our next action would not be as well received. In 2003, apparently to continue the war against al-Qaeda, the U.S. invaded Iraq under suspicion of complicity. We call this Operation Iraqi Freedom. This will cause much tension and anti-American feeling in parts of the Middle East. For many Middle Easterners, the U.S. invasion evokes a reminder of late 19th and early 20th century imperialism with the very same product at stake, oil. In 2014, the U.S. along with other allies formed a coalition to fly airstrikes over Iraq and Syria in response to the growth of the Islamic State. This is called Operation Inherent Resolve. So the question becomes, can we fight a war against ideology? How do people react when confronted with something they do not agree with? And how should they react? These are questions hopefully we'll have time to discuss today.